Welcome everyone. I'm Kristen Hipwell, the Director of Product Marketing with Perfection Learning, and I'm excited to have each of you joining us for tonight's AP Literature and AP Language webinar, Analytical Writing Templates and Starters. Before we get started, two quick items. One, if you have questions during the webinar, please be sure to post them in the chat section at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be addressed throughout the session as appropriate and at the end of the webinar. And then two, Perfection Learning will be sending out an email tomorrow with the recording of the webinar, as well as the slide deck that's been used. So you'll get all of that tomorrow. It is my pleasure to introduce two of my favorite people and our teachers for this evening. Our moderator tonight, Dr. Brandon Abden, comes to us with over 20 years of experience in the classroom in varied roles, including as a high school English teacher, English and education professor, and an instructional coach. Brandon also formerly worked as the Director of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment for AP English at the College Board. And Brandon's special guest tonight is Tim Freitas. Tim is a College Board-endorsed AP English Language and Composition Consultant and has been teaching AP Lang for more than a decade and AP Lit for almost as long. He has been an AP Reader and worked on the College Board's instructional design team for the new AP Lang framework, and he is also the founder of the Garden of English website. Our favorite credential on both of their resumes is their combined work on Perfection Learning's AP Language Coursebook by AMSCO and also Brandon's work on our AP Literature Coursebook. Thank you both so much for being here to share your knowledge. Brandon, I'm going to pass it off to you. Thank you so much, Kristen. <clears throat> and uh, I'm really excited uh, for everyone that's here. I'm really excited that Tim uh, is able to do this. And, and, you know, Tim, you and I talk like every other day. I feel so, like that. I so do. I don't, I, I don't, like I don't that. know that these people realize what they're going to get into. Like, like th there could be some serious banter tonight. I, no, I, I don't, I don't know. So, yeah, Brandon, so we will just Brandon's see. never shy to throw me right under the bus. There's no doubt about it. Whoa, wait a minute. You know, <laughs> I've never done that to your face. You know, I mean, come on. So uh, now let me, uh, let me share my screen here. Um, I think if you have been to these webinars before, you know the routine. If you've not been before, then I'm going to go ahead and ask you to find the chat and share your name and where you're at, please. It'd be great to see uh, people from all over the country. Uh, some of you have already done that. Uh, Donna Carpenter, it is good to see you. Donna uh, and I were table mates at my, at my last AP literature reading. It was good to see you there, Donna. Um, and we're seeing so many other people popping in from Georgia, Tennessee, Saw uh, some Arizona's. There's a Boston there. Paula from Boston. Go Bruins. That's all. Love I it. Say. Love it. She might not be a Bruins fan. No, no. You know? she, she, if you're from Boston, you're a Bruins fan. That's how. Oh, it works. okay. Yeah. Okay. I understand. And, and, so. and, if, and if you're not a Bruins fan, then I'm going to volunteer you that you are one. Okay. I see Jessica here from, from Kentucky and welcome Jessica. I'm glad you're here, Jessica, because there's all these people here from South of the border. I mean, Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, I'm glad we have some more people, Kentucky people here. Um, and uh, all right, everybody. So you see me sharing my screen. This up here is a, a picture of uh, from Tim's website, Garden of English. Um, and uh, it's a picture of me when I had a lot more going on, a lot more weight and a lot more hair. Uh, but uh, uh, that was a, a great time we got to spend hanging out in Cincinnati right after uh, COVID kind of opened up. We do. I do need to update. Right, Tim, we got to get another picture. Well, sometimes. you know what? It's great because we're going to Cincinnati this this coming June to read. So that's right. And mm -hmm. you and I will, I'll see you in Boston, I think, here in a few weeks. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah, I will. Um, I'm going to stop by for about an hour in the afternoon yeah. before you guys great. go to dinner. So, yep. yeah, that'd be great. Great. Be great to see you. So there's some good people there. But all right, everybody. Uh, best. Uh, Kelly says that Donna Carpenter is the best table leader ever. Um, probably even better than you, Tim. I'm just saying Don is pretty awesome. Oh. So I can't say because I wasn't at your table, but I'm just guessing. Yeah. Knowing you, I'm guessing. So there, I just threw you under the bus to your face. There you go. I know. I know. Right. I got it. <laughs> all right, everybody. Well, welcome. Um, you know, all all goofing around aside, it's great that everybody's here. Um, you will get the recording of this session um in, in your inbox uh, sometime later this week, probably tomorrow. Um and you will have access to all the materials that are shared here. You'll get links uh, as well. And uh, of course, you can go to Garden of English to get access to Tim's direct stuff. But um, uh, Brandon, I'm just going to answer one of the questions sure. in the chat. It was just yeah. how long you have to teach to be a table a table leader. Um, yeah. well, to, be, to be a reader, you have to, um, I think they cut it down to two years uh, in the AP Lane course. However, I did meet somebody who just finished 
uh, a first year last year in an elevator and she was like, I got a call. She's like, I put my application in because I was told to um, at my APSI. And at the end of the year, I got a call because I needed a reader. So I know I, th I think the stipulation is two years now, not three like it used to be. Yep. And then to become a table leader, uh, it just depends on your reading and you get recommended by your current table leader. And then they go through and they have this magic selection process that I don't even know about. I'm just, you know, kind of involved in it somehow. No, um, it's magic. Yeah. They, they're right. There you go. Um, some wizardry and witchcraft and signing a black book in the forest and dancing with, you know, uh, dancing with the spirit. You seem to know an awful lot about the occult there, Tim. <laughs> just saying. Um no, uh, yeah, it, it, I'm glad uh, people are interested in that. You can uh, literally, you can just type in how do I become an AP reader into Google because the website on College Board's website is called How Do I Become an AP Reader? Yeah. Um, and it will uh, it'll tell you all how to do it. Uh, it's a great experience. You can do it digitally. Um, if you'd like to do it digitally, uh, literature is staying in Salt Lake. If you all haven't heard, language is moving to Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, my former hometown. And I love Cincinnati. It's a great spot. So I was so there. pumped when I found out. Yeah. yeah and Lauren great... Pearson lives right near there and she's the other co-author on our That's right. book. That's right. So maybe we'll have to get, have a get together for Abden, Freitas and Peterson all together okay. here for the, at the reading. So, yeah. all right. Um, so I would just like everybody to, to, to think about this uh, at the end of this uh, session, you're going to be asked to do a brief survey. My, my colleague, Kristen, uh, who introduced us um, will remind you of the survey. Um, and it's really just a one question survey. And it's like, what would you, what else would you like to see? And in one of the last surveys, you know, cause we do read them, we do pay attention to them. Um, someone wrote this and I hear things like this a lot, but I, I liked pulling this quote out. It says, students can tell me a lot about the text and they see things that matter, but they don't explain how those things matter. And I really like the way this was phrased because it says they see things that matter. It, it, the way I approach it, it, you know, they're able to put their finger on things in the text that they know, like, like this is important. I know it's important. This word is important. This metaphor is, is important. This rhetorical choice to, to repeat this word is important if we're thinking literature and language. Um, so the students get it, but they're just not explaining it. Now, some of us call this commentary. That is the term we use now in the rubric. Um, on the old rubric, it might have been called uh, analysis, which is a problem. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. That word is a problematic. Um, but I really like that this teacher says you know, they don't explain how. Because I'm going to talk about and lead into Tim giving some examples, too, of, of what, how, and then why. Uh, in kind of an abstract and show show some things that I use in my classroom that we have in the textbook and then, and uh, show some examples of that. And then Tim's going to share some of his examples too from the website. But the first thing I'd like you all to do is type in the chat and don't hit enter yet. Don't hit enter until I ask you to. I want you to define analysis. I'm going to give everybody about 30 seconds to a minute of thinking and writing time, which isn't enough. I know do your best. And when I say go, hit enter so that everybody's definitions can blast. About 30 more seconds. Okay, everybody, take that finger and hit enter. Let's see what we got here. All right, and once you've hit enter, go ahead and kind of scroll back and look at what your your partners, or sorry, your uh, colleagues have have posted here. Molly, I like this breaking something into parts. Tim, if you see something that stands out to you, feel free to call it out. Um, Elizabeth's talking about breaking stuff into parts too. That's great. Donna's talking about examining parts. Good. Ex examining how details, right? Okay, Liz, I get you. If I if I skip yours, it's not because it was bad. I, I just am, am skimming here. Break down into components. 
Yep. Breaking uh, things down and examining them closely. I like that. Yep. Explaining the strategies the writer makes to achieve his or her purpose. Sure. So I see a lot of breakdown. Colleen just says to pick yep. it apart. I don't disagree with that, Colleen. Yep. Looking below the surface to find the glittering diamond that shakes your world. Wow. Jennifer, I think you've got like three metaphors in there and they all make sense. <laughs> I know. They all make sense together. I love it. I know. The aha moment that lights you up. There's a fourth metaphor. So uh great. Um, but I, I totally get it. You know, and I love that you're talking about the surface. It reminds me of that poem, Tim, uh, that um um Billy Collins poem about skimming across the surface of a poem. Um great. You assume that I've that I've read it. You what? haven't read that one? Oh my no. gosh. There's the yeah. There's going to be like 90 people send you, let's see, there's 45 people live right now, 51, 52 of them, because count me, are going to send you, are going to send you a link to that poem. So, well, it's better um, than hate mail. (laughs) It is. is, is. So, all right. Well, thank you all. Um, Just to get our brains going and thinking about that. Now, I want to, I want to show you something here. Now, Tim, you might know what this is, so don't spoil it, but can anybody tell me? what this is yes it's a word cloud good but where did these words come from and does anybody have any ideas there patricia just dropped in the link to introduction to poetry tim so jill nails it these are from the ced yes so what i did i took the verbs from all of the skills for all sorry for both courses the language course and the literature course And I put them into a word cloud. And this is what we got. So explain the biggest. And that's what we're going to talk about there. But then we have identify and describe, identify next, and then describe and develop about the same. We have write, we have demonstrate, and then a little smaller, we have qualify, recognize, select, distinguish. Yeah. And use there too. I skipped use. Okay. Stephanie Carter notices. Hi, Stephanie. I was doing a webinar with Stephanie earlier today. Um, no analyze. Oh, just now, let, real let, quick, Brennan. The yes, question Tim. just showed up here. What is the CED? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that is the course and exam description that you can access. Um, the AP Lang course and exam description, which outlines the nine units as a green cover. The lit one that Brandon's holding up has a, that's a bluish cover, right, Brandon? Yeah, it is blue. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then here's the green one. So, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's the course and exam description. Um, if you don't have your folder, you can get a copy of it on the College Board's website. Um, and it, it, or you can just email me or Tim at the end of this, and I can, I'll yep. send you the link. Um, but this is, uh, so all of all the skills, these are the only verbs that are there. So no analyze. Now, here's what happened. Here's why this is the case. Uh, oh, you just didn't remember the acronym. Cool. Gotcha. No, no, no. Liz, um, sometimes we have teachers join these who aren't yet get AP teachers. And so I wanted to make sure that uh, if you were had not yet been an AP teacher that you knew what was up. So thanks for clarifying. So one of the things we recognized when I started coaching and working with teachers, and then when I went to college board and got to spend more time in classrooms um, with AP teachers all over the country, you know, very well-meaning, they would give activities and assignments that said, you know, asking students to analyze things. But then I noticed the questions teachers had to ask, had to ask, sorry, had to answer for students. And I noticed, I looked at the feedback, looked closely at the feedback that teachers were giving to students on the activity, on things they were doing. And it became pretty clear that kids didn't know what it meant to analyze. And actually, just real quick, Brandon, one of the things that I learned sure. early in my career, and I actually am, you know, a uh, perpetrator of this from in my early career. Me too. I would always put as a comment, like when I needed more of that explanation, I would just write more analysis. But that was when I actually assigned writing instead of taught writing. Yeah. Um, and I would write more analysis, just assuming that kids would know what it is. And we'll talk about what it is more, you know, um, later on. But I'm I'm totally with you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it. it and I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, I mentioned that earlier today in the other webinar I was doing, uh, the d- the difference between assigning writing and teaching writing, and the fact that we have to break these things down and what it means to analyze. And a lot of you all, when I asked you to define it, you were using these things. 
you were using the word explain or describe. You were using the word identify. Um, and, and those are really the key because when I take all of the skills from the course and exam descriptions, I also get those writing skills from the language course that do matter, but we're focusing on analysis for this session. So rhetorical analysis and then the uh, the, the essays in literature as well. Um, and, and Tim, I, I love what you've dropped here. You know, you give a really easy assignment to help kids understand the process. I love it. We'll make sure to, to, um, to talk about that in a little bit. Um, so asking students to do activities that build these things and then helping them see how the parts fit together. But the biggest thing here, and I don't think anybody's surprised about that, is explain. That's the commentary, that explanation bit. And, and we'll see that here in just a moment. So we think about analysis. What is it? Well, to analyze, when we think about cognitively what we're asking students to do, right, we ask students to recognize, identify, and distinguish the things in a text, putting their finger on things in the text. Here's this thing. Here's this thing. And I'm going to talk more about that here in just a moment. Then describe and explain. Describing what they're seeing, explaining how that thing works. And then write, develop, and qualify. And I'm sorry that I missed the Oxford comma here after develop. And I have it up here after identify. I'm an Oxford comma believer and I made a mistake. But these are the three levels. And so asking students to start with this, this recognize, identify, and distinguish, it's, it's level one, not just because I have three bullets. It's level one because it's really the lowest level. It, if we think of, about a Bloom's level or depth of knowledge kind of thing, it's pretty low. Kids saying, oh, here's this. It's what I used to call battleship. Tim, you've got another analogy for it. What, what's yours? For the what? Where they, they're just seeking and destroying things. I used to call it battleship. Where they're oh, saying, oh, um, no, I always call it just get, you know, give him whatever you're doing the finger like this one. Yeah. Yeah. I do that too. To, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah, and that matters, but you can't stop there. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you're just asking kids to I, I recognize and identify, which I did my first couple of years teaching, I thought, well, that's enough, right. That they're able to recognize and identify this stuff. Then, um, it's, it's not going far enough. They have to be able to describe and explain describe the thing and explain how it works. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And then they have to be able to work that into a full essay. So think about scaffolding your entire course using these things. And I'm not saying like doing all of this in the first quarter and then doing all of this in the next. No, it's constant cycles um, that we talk about. So I like to approach students. And when I'm working with teachers, I like to do it this way. Analysis relies on two or three questions. The what, the how. So what is the writer or author using? So what choice are they making in rhetorical analysis? Or what literary element or technique are they using? Okay, and uh, so I guess some more things coming up here in the chat. Um, with all the things for new teachers. Oh, yeah. Well, Kelly, uh, Tim, you see that? Uh, do you uh, want to say anything I, about I that? I did see that, Brandon. All right. Did, did Brandon mention oh. that we're on the phone all the time? Uh, all I'm going to say, man. folks, is that y'all just y'all just hold tight. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, Tim and I have something in the works. Um, yeah, Kelly, it's so... Yeah, I promise I did not ask Kelly to say that. Another con... Uh, I would say another convo for another day. Yes. But yes. Gets me excited though, Tim. Like I want to stay up all night, but I've got stuff to do. Um, Kristen's like, no, don't stay up all night. You've got a planning, a pacing guide to get to me. It's like, I know. So, uh, all right. So then we think, how? How does that thing affect the text? So I could take those verbs that we just looked at and overlay them here. Okay, the identify, recognize, the describe and explain here. So here we are. Identify the elements, techniques, or choices. Level one, okay? Here's this thing this person's doing, great. Then commentary, explain the function. The word here is the function in the text. So lots of times students will, will say, well, 
here's a metaphor and here's how metaphors work. Well, that's doing nothing for me. I need to know how it functions in the text. Well, then you see, I say relies on two or three questions. There is a third here. Why should I care? And I say, I hold it off to the end because this may not be something I introduce early on in the course. This may not be something I introduce until later when I feel like they're pretty good at explaining the things they're finding, when I want them to start thinking about broader contexts or ideas. Okay. And so the what, the how, and the why. I know it sounds too simple, it, it, and it's not that simple, but it's a good way to help you and your students think about the tasks in general. Tim, before Ready? I move on, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I'm going to chime in, and you all will see this a little later when I actually look at paragraphing stuff uh, with you all with templates, and I'll show you where to access those and whatnot. But one of the things that I wanted to point out is that when we talk about analysis, um, when I was a new teacher, probably um, in like 2011, between 2010 and 2012, I was teaching Lang and Lit, and I was reading a voracious amount of essays, and I was, that's when we were on the nine-point scale, and I was reading seven, eights, and nines all the time. Uh, not in my classroom, I mean like just to help my instruction. And I noticed that every high scoring paper, every single one had the exact same pattern of body paragraphs. Yep. And what happened was, is that in the topic sentence, there was always a what and a why. And then it was followed by where it was seen in the text, followed by an explanation of how where it was seen in the text achieves the why in the topic sentence. Yep. And that's where I created my templates from. And you'll notice that... The only question that's not on Brandon Sheet is where, but it's implied where it is, what is the what you know, what is the writer doing or using, because we need to say where that is when we find it. Uh, and that's where my pattern kind of comes from, directly from here. And like I said, I'll I'll explain more of that later. But it's mm -hmm. exactly that pattern was how I created my templates because every seven, eight, and nine did it every single time. Yep. Yeah. And so um, I'm glad you said that, Tim, because one other thing that I've got here, too, and that I noticed, uh, I have the word connect here as a verb and that we didn't see that on the previous sheets. Um, but I've noticed and other other readers, I think, would agree with this, um, that the essays that tend to do really, really, really well are the ones that can connect to something bigger. That's why we have that phrase in the sophistication point, connect to a broader context or bigger universal idea or, or const construct. And so that's why I add this in here. Um, but certainly students can do well on the exam. You don't have to get a six to get a five. Remember that everybody, you don't have to get a six on the essay to get a five on the exam. All right, you can get fives on the essays. The average essay score for kids who get fives on the exam is a five, not a six. Okay, Kelly says, uh, how do we know what the reader is okay with as far as why? goes uh kelly can uh let's actually let's take kelly off mute and let kelly explain because i want to make sure i understand her question uh kelly tibbler is it still? yeah yeah so go ahead hi kelly you... more of um thank you but um uh -huh. tim said that and i just took notes um about the why, the, okay, so to, the topic, the why is where in the text do you find it and then connect it to something bigger, but then he said um, something about the why. How do we know what the AP reader is looking for in the why? All right, Brandon, I'm gonna actually take this question if you don't mind. Go for it. It's directed towards my kind of function yeah. there. Yeah, so Kelly, it. great question. Um, the, the why that Brandon is talking about like that kind of bigger connection is a different why than I'm going to talk about with my, with my template. So I, I do apologize for creating some confusion there. That was my fault. Okay. Um, the why that my students will always put in there for analysis, whether rhetorical analysis or literary analysis will be based on the function of it in the text. And I, I actually have scaffolded questions that kids can ask so that we can help them get to that why part. So I will show you exactly what those look like when I, when I get to show you the resources that I have for you in a little bit. Yeah. Um, just y'all, first year AP teacher, it's too much. It's all so much. Yep. 
It is. And just, just rely on what you know about good teaching. And I know that, you know, may sound to make it sound too simple, but I have people all the time ask me about coming to do workshops on AP. Well, Tim does too, you know, AP strategies and like, you know, what, what is an AP strategy? Like it's just good teaching. And so if you've been teaching for a while, rely on what you know about good teaching and just, you know, using complex text and, and supporting kids um, and, and things will be okay. Um, and, and I'm sorry uh, to create any confusion with this why bit too. Sometimes I say what, how, and so what, like, so what, you know, why, why do I care? You know, you're writing about Hamlet 500 years later. Why does it matter? You're writing about a speech that was given in 1920. So what? Uh, and we got to make it about something bigger, um, but it'll all make sense. And you guys will find your own ways to approach it too. Uh, none of these are, 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 are etched in stone. Um, so one of the ways that I, one of the things that I think about whenever I'm creating those activities is I think about this very simple little table, but building activities using this, keeping this in mind does so much because this moves students from the concrete, the thing they're putting their finger on to a, so what, or a, why does this matter? And it's very simply, it says, this. So you're quoting the text. I say, and therefore it says this, I say this, you know, so the student is saying, you know, it says this, it gives this metaphor. I think that means this, this, and this in the text. Therefore the text is talking about X and it takes practice and you may find a way to make this your own. I'm going to show you an example of that, uh, how we've changed this around in different ways in the textbook, um, but also ways that I, I work with my students when I'm, I'm teaching them, uh, my college students and high school students. Um, but yeah, it isn't influenced by this, they say, I say text. You might uh, be familiar with this. Um, and, and this is the original cover of it, um, but uh, it's come out in many different versions since then. But then it, I also constantly think about this idea. It's This is the formula for an inference. And it is old information plus new information equals an inference. So the old information here, I would say, is the quote. The new information is what the student has to say about it, and their conclusion is their inference. Okay, You may think, well, that doesn't make sense to me. I would do it this other way. You know what? Then do it. Tim and I have found a way to work together for years. And we'll all the time say, well, you're going to do it that way, but I'm going to do it this way. I'm like, cool, but we still figure it out. So take these things and make them your own. Tim, were you going to say something? No, I'm just I'm just agreeing. I can't tell you how many times Brandon and I are like, yep, this is how we do it. And it makes sense that you do it that way and I do it this way. So let's actually yep. try to present both options to the people when we work together. That's right. That's right. So here is an example from uh, the uh, literature textbook. Uh, no, sorry, this is the language textbook, from the language textbook. Um, and it says, uh, you know, this chart below provides analysis of the students' rhetorical choices. Um, and this is an, an, an analysis of text messages from a student to different audiences, and that should be a period there, sorry. But here you see the evidence. This is the it says. All right. And then this is more of the it says with you know the students or the, sorry what the students saying about those rhetorical choices and then what the writer believes the mom's going to get back from it i'm sorry what the what, what the writer believes about the mom's background this is getting more to the abstract and so it's not the exact same as that it says i say therefore but i think you can see how it is influenced by that so i'm constantly thinking about how do i ground them in the text it says and then show them a process to get to some sort of inference or conclusion about the text, the therefore bit. I might have to add multiple steps depending on how complex it is or the student's level of comfort with the text. Um, but I'm always thinking it says, they say, sorry, it says, I say, therefore, because that's the basics of what we want students to be doing when they analyze something. So here's another example. That's from the uh, literature textbook. This is uh, used with uh, No Exit. Um, sorry, different book, Exit West. Uh, who in the world let me write a book where I have No Exit and Exit West, both as sample text? I screw it up all the time. Um, I'll blame my editor. It's certainly not my fault, right, Tim? Um, we'll blame Carol. Um, but here you see a claim with evidence 
how that evidence was used strategically, and then the commentary about it. So it's not exactly it says, I say, therefore. But you see the same components in here. Constantly thinking about what's the relationship between the concrete thing that the text says, the things I can put my finger on, and what I'm going to say about it. And that is because I want students to start recognizing and if you've been to any of my workshops, you've seen this cartoon a thousand times. Um, in this class, they have to start thinking about the complex. And I love this cartoon. You can Google it. If you Google complex car complexity cartoon, you'll find it. Uh, but in the AP class, we want these students, the complex but right students. And it's going to mean grabbing a book. It's going to mean grabbing and doing some research, working kind of zigzag back and forth, working uphill, but that's way better than keeping it simple and going off the cliff. And how does that matter? Because I want them saying things about what they're seeing in the text that they're reading. What they, and, the, and saying complex things about it. And that's also why I have the yin yang on here. For every yin, there's a yang. And so we're thinking about opposing paradoxical ideas all the time. But I might not introduce this immediately. This would come down the road a little bit once they're a little bit more comfortable with analyzing things. And I'll move on past this for sake of time. So when we start thinking about templates and things, because that's what we were going to do uh, with this. Um, these are examples from the book, but also things that I use in class and that Tim has used in class and the, um, the literature ones my colleague Becky, she uses in her class. So um, we see the checklist for developing a claim about literature. Giving students these checklists that you've taught them, that they've seen the process, allows them to become more comfortable doing it. So why not allow them to have a checklist like this while they're doing the work? But then we give them these sorts of organizers. So this one is for a paragraph. And you're filling it out with them. So you see here we have an example filled out. And then maybe you fill the next one out with students and then they fill it out. But then when you ask them to go write their own paragraph, let them have this organizer out. Let them have it filled out sitting in front of them so they have an example and they see exactly they're learning the process. They see models and they know Just how it works. On that, Brandon. Please go um, right ahead. So when, in my classroom, I give my students a lot of templates and then yep. I always tell them, you got to have the parts. If you choose to do something on your own with it, you got to just prove that it's better. If you could do something better, as long as it's got the parts, we're good, right? A, a, mm -hmm. a Chevy and a Tesla both have wheels, both have doors, both have motors, but one of them works a lot better, right? Yeah. Um, Great. And, but they still do the job. So um, what I was going to say about that was that I let my kids use their templates on their timed writings and their writings like that they have to write on demand for me all the way through February. It's not until the end of February Great. that I take those away. Yeah. And it's about making them comfortable and helping them see it. And so maybe a next step with this is you have them highlight evidence from the text here in green. And then when they go to look at their own essays or their own paragraphs, they have to highlight where they've done that in green. And then have them highlight the commentary here in, I don't know, pink. And then when they go to look at their own, own paragraphs, they have to highlight those in pink before you read them. Because you don't want to read bad paragraphs. You're just going to ask them to make the same revisions. So they're highlighting and doing that stuff and almost grading it for you. And then you let them revise. All right. Um, and yeah, Wendy, doing it. I do until a week before the exam. That's great. Um, the way I used to do it is I would let them use it in the second semester. I'd let them have it out for a few minutes while they planned when I did a timed writing, but then I would have them put it away or I'd take it from them so they could look at it, plan, just kind of get used to it and get comfortable with it. So, oh, you're a four by four. That makes sense. So, and so then this isn't color coded, like I just mentioned, but you could do it give them a sample paragraph or write a sample paragraph with them. I'll show you that in a moment and label the parts with them. Let them see the parts labeled apart from the organizer or the template. And maybe let them have this out while they do, do the writing too. It's not going to be the exact same paragraph. Like Tim said, this might be a Tesla and they're going to end up writing a Chevy or a Ford. I don't know anybody would write a Chevy. I drive a Ford, but um, we, we, they, they still are going to have the same components. 
Right. Now, some people are going to say, Tim, I haven't heard this yet, but uh, people always say it. Yeah, but formulaic writing is not real writing. And I get asked I all, get the time, all the time, people will say to me, well, when's college board going to do away with a 3.5 essay or the three, the three paragraph essay? Well, listen, I will argue that these aren't even really essays. They're constructed responses. And those are different things. I know some people will disagree with me, but the, with the time constraint, it's really about answering the question and showing what you can do. Do you have any thoughts on that, Tim? Yeah, yeah all I'm going to tell you is this, right? Whenever people are like, oh, formulaic writing, you know, is lousy. Um, all of the templates that I use come from my graduate work that I got A's on. And so, or those seven, eights and nines, right? So that's how I've developed everything. And I show my students in my AP Lit class that I have an English paper that uses my AP Lit thesis statement to a T, and there's my teacher. What an incredibly insightful paper that was awesome, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, look, it's just it's just good. Um, if, if if a template is good, then it's still like good writing is good writing. Now, is it nice to then build break from that and then kind of like let kids be free? Of course. But most yep. of the time, when you just assign writing but don't teach it first, the kids can't even break free from it. Like, how do you actually riff out on a on a bass guitar if you don't actually know a jazz scale, yep. right? And, and my, so sometimes you need a good scale before you can actually just do what you got to do. You know, and and you you use a music analogy. I will often use a, a sports analogy. Um, you know, when when you first learn to swing a baseball bat, um, and I say this because a lot of people have done it, but a lot of people haven't done it, but they know what a baseball bat is. When you first learn to do it, there's certain things you have to learn in the way to stand. But then as you do it more, you get more comfortable making some adjustments that work best for you as a player. And that's the same thing with writing. But uh, the people who, I like to remind the people sometimes who are saying that, that yeah, that's not how you did it. And you're an English major. The people we're teaching, most of them are not English majors. They need to learn how to stand in the box. They need to learn how to put their fingers on the fretboard. Uh, so, um, and the, I see more analogies coming through, like the recipe. That's right, Kimberly. That's that's absolutely right. I love it. Um, so in the textbooks, we do things like this. We give, in each chapter, each uh, unit, we give um, these types of organizers. So this is for a paragraph, and then it builds in, in subsequent units where this is now a paragraph with multiple pieces, multiple supporting claims and multiple pieces of evidence. And then we build into a larger essay as well. Um, but we always want to think about that line of reasoning, that common thread with the thesis statement here. Um, but using those organizers, those templates helps make that happen even more smoothly. So, um, as I want to, we're not done. Uh, I want to show you two examples of this. I want to hand it over to Tim. Uh, so here's one thing that I create with my students. This is for a literature example uh, for Chopin's story of an hour. We'll write a paragraph together and they'll see me do it. And this is from one that I use with my AP Summer Institute people. They'll see me do it. After they see me write a thesis and then we break out the parts of the thesis into the organizer. We then do the same thing with the paragraph. We still, and we color code to make everything match. And this is a one, two, zero, and then we break it out. So here you see IEL, identify, example, and link. And they're seeing those things in that paragraph. Then we expand it into a one, three, zero. What would a, what would a better paragraph look like here in a better thesis? Then we take it further. What might a one four zero look like? But they're seeing me do it. They're seeing me having to think through these things. And it's so important because if you, Tim's heard me say it, those on here have heard me say it, but kids think we know the special knock, that we know where the chamber of secrets is. It's and, actually a handshake. Yeah, the, the secret handshake, whatever. Um, and uh, don't tell anybody about the handshake, Tim. I told you, don't, 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 like, the number one rule about this is you don't talk about it. Um, but the uh, the idea here is that they see you having to think through these things and it gives them permission to make a mistake or to write, use the wrong word or get stuck and not be able to remember the word. Okay. Because they think because it comes so easily to you and other people that it's just not meant for them. And then you see another example of this with AP language here. Um, this is from the essays that I wrote with my people this summer, 
where we then went back. So this is the one on the King Maxine King Hongston uh, individual voices. And we go back and highlight the different parts. So they're actually seeing how those different parts fit into a paragraph. Now, Brendan, um, are yeah. participants going to have access to this, uh, these examples that you're showing? Absolutely. I'm okay, going to give links to these. Where can participants get those, uh, get that These action. links will be in the PowerPoint that they get when the email comes to them tomorrow or Friday. Yep. So I'm going to stop sharing now so that Tim can share because he's got some similar things to offer. Um, go right ahead, Tim. You should have access to sharing your screen. All right, so I should have some share access here. Can you are sharing this? your screen. Yep. Good. That's not the screen that I want, though. I think this is, yeah, this is the screen that I want. I have to uh, refresh. Okay. So um, for me, this will, um, if you're looking for the information that I'm going to give, if you were to go to thegardenofenglish.com, and I'll actually toss that in the chat right here, but it's just thegardenofenglish.com. Everything that I'm going to just kind of talk about here is going to be in the files and resources tab. Okay. Uh, and then I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Okay. And you're going to notice that I kind of label everything. So you kind of know what you're looking at or, you know, mostly what you're looking at. And I'm going to scroll down to where it says rhetorical and literary analysis templates and examples. And the particular one that you're looking for, because you can read the titles, is this one right here, Conquering Commentary for Rhetorical and Literary Analysis Perfection Webinar. So that's the this is the document that I'm going to pull up on my screen and talk about here a little bit. It's not a beautiful slideshow like Brandon's, but that's because Brandon's cooler than I am. So it is what it is. Um, as long as we all recognize that, I'm fine. <laughs> there we go, right? Um, so this is this is the document here. Um, first of all, feel free to contact me. I'm, I am super busy, but I will get back to you within a week. Um, uh, I'm only one man with five kids and one of them plays hockey and that's like a cult. So, um, but nonetheless, I will get back to you. I'm happy to work with any teachers who need assistance with um, or are looking for more support. I'm happy to do that, okay? Um, when it comes to commentary, right? I'm gonna give you all some templates and whatnot and some scaffolded questions. But I think the hardest thing for commentary for students is the idea that they don't actually know what it is. Um, and I think that a lot of times teachers don't even necessarily know how to explain what it is. Uh, so there are two activities that I think you can do, uh, actually three, uh, but two activities I think you can do that can help kids kind of work to understand what commentary is. The first one I actually learned from Hepzibah Roskelly, who is like the who's who of rhetoricians in this country. Um, she's absolutely incredible. But one day I was sitting in a seminar with her and she asked us all to picture a barn. and uh, Sorry, and a farm with a barn on it. So we sat there and we were envisioning this barn and farm and, and whatnot. And then she started asking some really interesting questions. She said to us, she said, okay, how many of you had a red barn? So some of us raised our hands. How many of you had the white trim around the door? Some of us raised our hands. How many of you had a weather vane? Some of us raised our hands. What was your weather vane? Mine was a whale, obviously, because I live on the coast. Brandon's was actually a rooster. All right. Actually, Brandon's like, I didn't even have a weather vane. Right. Oh, no, I had a weather vane and a barn. Oh, good. Okay. So she'd ask us about the silo by the barn. How many of you had that? How many of you had the gimbrel roof? How many of you had the straight roof? And then it was interesting because as she asked people to describe the barn that they pictured, some people were like, actually, my barn was run down. And it was the one that I actually used to drive by on my way to my grandma or grandpa's house or, or my cousin's house or my aunt's house or you know anything like that. Another person's like, mine was actually from the old McDonald that I read about to my child the other day. Um, and the reason why this was such a, uh, a, a strong moment for me for understanding commentary is that we were all talking about the same word, farm. But when we, when we envisioned the barn and the farm, we all did it with the experiences that we brought to the table to understand that word. So it's the same word. And we all were picturing a farm and a barn, but we all pictured it differently. So if we were going to explain what our farm looked like or describe it even, we're going to have different descriptions because some of them are in cartoon form. Some of them are in rundown form. Some of them are, have the nice trim around the doors. Um, and so this is where I tell kids, look at your experience is what analysis actually is. It's your experience with words. And because you have different experiences than other people, then how you provide your commentary is going to actually be different 
Um, and people that have less experience, it's going to be a little bit harder. So the next thing that I do with my students is I take out my red marker and I ask them to tell me what color it is. And they can all tell me red. And then I ask how, because that's, as Brandon said, is the key question to get kids to think about when it comes to providing analysis and commentary. How? The problem is, is that most of my kids have not taken color theory. So when I say, how is it red? They say, well, because we were taught it's red or because it is red, as if it's just obvious. And so sure enough, most of your kids struggle with commentary because they pick the right evidence, but because it's just obvious to them and they don't have the words to articulate how it's obvious, they, they say, well, it's red because the company made it that way. But that doesn't actually explain how it's red. But my, my artists are like, I know. Human eyes see the white light spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And as the white light hits the cap, all of those rays are absorbed except for the red ones, which are reflected and then absorbed by your rods and cones and go through your retina and register as red. And I'm like, ding, 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 you get an A. But the reason why that student can give me a much more articulate answer as to how something is red is because that student has more experiences. And that's really, really important is that we don't want kids to feel like they have zero experience. We want them to learn how to articulate the experiences that they do have, because obviously they have something if they can say, this text obviously shows this. And if the text is right, then we're like, okay, now we got to get them to articulate it. And that's where my templates will come in in just a minute. What's up, Brennan? Uh, I didn't mean to come off mute, um, oh. but no, you, you're fine. But uh, I, since you said this, I will go ahead and say that one of the things that I often try to remind teachers that I work with is, you know, the only difference between you and your students is experience. Yeah. And so we have to provide them with the experiences to think about things the way that we've learned to think about them and write in a, uh, about things, that, not write about them, but write in a process and think in a process the way, we, way we've learned. But um, yeah, go ahead, Tim. You're, you're doing great. <clears throat> so the next assignment that I do, and this is just to help kids conceptualize what analysis is and, and what that kind of commentary and explanation format is. Um, this is just my example of it, but you can easily assign this to kids. Ask them, like, buy, buy a stack of paper bags, like lunch bags, and tell them, I want you tonight to go home and put four items in a bag about one activity that you do tonight, as long as it's school appropriate. And come in tomorrow and don't tell anybody what's in that bag. Don't tell anybody what you did. And then just bring it to class. You'll get a free 100 if you do it. And when the kids come to class, they need to exchange that bag with somebody else pull out the items, and then explain to the person who gave them the bag what that person did that night and how they know. And here's why this is important, because the kids are going to be like, well, this is a PS5 controller, so I'm assuming that you played a video game for the majority of the night because blah, blah, blah. And the kids are going to articulate some assumptions. What do we know about video game controllers? And then what do we know about this person, right? And as they articulate the connections between things, right? What, let's say you put like dog food in there, a dog collar, a leash, and some shoes. I'm going to assume that you fed your dog and took your dog on a walk. Well, why would I do that? The kids are explaining these things. And what they're doing is they're articulating their assumptions and their experiences with the evidence to make an overarching claim as they analyze what somebody else has provided to them. So now if kids do this, what if somebody can't explain what happened the night before because of what's in the bag? Well, the person probably didn't put the most precise items in the bag. And that becomes the fault of the person who created the bag, not the person who's trying to interpret the bag. And these are just great ways to get kids to realize, oh, my word, I have assumptions about these items, these concrete things that I can touch and experience sensibly that allow me to create more articulate ideas. And this is where I start my kids with understanding what commentary is. Now, my example here is just about a suitcase and what's in the suitcase and can you make a claim about where I went? But these are ways that we wanna get kids thinking about what analysis is. Because then when you say, I need more analysis or more commentary, they realize I have to deal more with my experience and my, con my understanding of assumptions and connotations. So the next thing that we wanna do is we wanna give the kids the language to do this. And that's where a lot of my templates come in that I'm going to show you here over the next few minutes. Okay. 
When you ask kids, how do you know? That's commentary. That's breaking into the analysis that we're looking for here. Okay. Um, and so you have access to all of this. Once again, gardenofenglish.com, files and resources. Scroll down to literary and rhetorical analysis. Look for the one that says webinar. It's this document. Okay. So when your kids are reading, how do we get kids past just saying that's a metaphor? Well, I always I don't like to use rhetorical like terms like that. I like to tell kids that they have to use verbs. I want them to say that's a compare like that author's comparing or that author's contrasting, because a kid understands the function of something more if the kid can identify it if it's a comparison or a contrast. Okay, um, but that's a different story for a different time with different uh, with when there's more time. But in in nonfiction, when my kids take a section of text and I always make them break their readings into sections. I then have them look at a section and I say, I want you to answer this question. What can I infer from this section of text about the speaker's background, values, or beliefs? And if it's nothing, then you don't answer that question. And, and infer is just what we talked about earlier, right? I mean, yeah. what can I infer based upon things I could put my finger on? That's right. And the the inference is what you know. It's what you, I see this here. I have these experiences and now I'm synthesizing those. So it's the new knowledge, what I read. Yep. Known knowledge based on my experience yep. equals inference. This is, right. this is a perfect example of Tim and I, and we've talked about these things before, overlapping with things. We just have different approaches, just like yeah. you would have different approaches, y'all. Go ahead, Tim. I'll stop interrupting. No, that's okay. So then my kids are going to look at this question. What can I infer about the speaker's audience's backgrounds, values, beliefs, desires, or needs based on this? What is What should the intended audience experience emotionally? What's the speaker's argument and or the importance of discussing it right now, this moment? Or how does this section of the text relate to the speaker's argument as a whole? So my kids are always thinking about these questions so they can get the why. Now, this isn't the same why that Brandon talked about with connecting it to something more. I do that with my students in the conclusion. We ain't talking about that today. Okay. If you want to see that, I have a gar I have the Garden of English YouTube channel where I cover every essay, how to write everything and do all that with steps and um, other things. But these are the whys for the reading. For literature, I give my kids these scaffolded inferential questions. What can I infer about based on this section of the text? A character's traits, a character's relationship to other characters, a conflict or point of tension or suspense. How does this text influence or relate to another plot event potentially in the future? How does this relate to a mood and how does this relate to a theme? And these are the questions that we often say when we say, well, what's the effect of this? Unfortunately, your kids don't know what the crap that means. I don't even know what that means. I had to sit down one day and say, why did I ask that question? What did I actually mean? And these were the questions that came out of it when I thought about Lit and Lang. And actually, these questions came from me really thinking about when it says uh, in the Lit prompts, um, how does it influence the interpretation of the work as a whole? These are the questions about the work as a whole. How does this moment do this with a character, character's relationship, conflict or suspense, future plot event, uh, mood or theme. That's it. So I took these things that were significantly more abstract and said, here's what you're looking for, kids. And these whys, the answer to these questions becomes what they put in their topic sentence as their why. So somebody asked earlier, can you tell me about that why? Yeah. If I'm reading Most Dangerous Game, I want my kids to have a topic sentence that says Richard Connell begins by uh, describing a dark tropical night and a ship sailing by it while two friends argue in order to create an eerie mood. Boom, there's my topic sentence. And the mood, the the why part comes because my kids could answer that question. Oh, that's creepy. When they realize that Rainsford's actually a jerk, they can just say, oh, he's a jerk. Good. Well, what does he do to be a jerk? Well, Connell presents him being incredibly dismissive. There's their topic sentence. In this section of text, I know he's being dismissive. That creates his character of being a jerk. They can write about that. And if my kid writes a topic sentence that says Richard Cannell presents Rainsford dismissing Whitney and therefore coming off as a jerk, I'm down. Um, so these but Tim, that doesn't sound very like literary analysis smart. Well, that might be the case, but I'll tell you what the kid's doing the lit analysis that I need. 
and we'll work on flushing that out after. <laughs> there you go. And, and I didn't really mean that, y'all. No, I, I know. Got, I know. What I know what's th- going through people's minds. They're like, well, yeah. that doesn't. Yeah, it's a forty-minute yeah. essay, y'all. I know for sure. Speaking and of I forty want... minutes, time. Right. Sorry. No, no, totally fine. So what I want to talk about though is in relation to analysis in particular. I've got a lot of templates here. Most of you know that I have a YouTube video. I mean, a YouTube channel that works through every essay type for AP Lit and Lang and how to do it. And if it works in Lit and Lang, it's going to work in any other class too. But I really want to focus on this. First of all, I've got some templates for topic sentences. Okay. And I do have examples of these, but I do want to talk about commentary here because we need to give kids the foundations of what commentary entails and the language to do it. A lot of times kids will make a claim. This shows this period. I get it all the time when I'm at the reading and I'm like, I wish that that student just had a teacher who drilled that in that sentence, you have to put the word because at the end. That right there is the first game changer for commentary. Force kids to put the word because, because at that point, they're most likely going to jumpstart their reasoning. Now, it might be circular to begin with, but that's okay because we want to practice them trying to articulate what's going on. But that's the simplistic side of things. For my students, I give my kids for rhetorical analysis four sentence templates, and they know they have to do this every time. The first sentence has to have the word because in it. The second sentence has to start with the word since. The third sentence has to start with thus, if, and then have the word then in it. And the last sentence needs to say, understanding this would move the audience to whatever the audience is supposed to do, and then say due to the fact that. And so if I can just point out to everybody, we talked about it says, I say, therefore, that we see this here. We see a modified pattern of this because that is just the type of thinking we're trying to teach students. And then these templates are helping model for them the way that they put that thinking into writing. Yeah. And I do have examples of what these paragraphs look like. They're all available to you. And, but it's the, the kids need the language. And that's why we are looking to get kids uh, to not just assign writing, but to, to actually teach it. Now it does change just a little bit with lit analysis. So I have examples of lit analysis templates here, all the way from the thesis to topic sentences, but the commentary right? My kids know in liter- in, in literature and lit analysis, it works the same for poetry, prose, or open-ended. Their first sentence has a because. Their second start sentence starts with consequently since. They cannot do consequently if. It has to be since. Because if you u- let them use the word if in literature, it creates conjecture and literature is contrived. Well, if Romeo never drank the poison, no, but he did. Okay. We, we did. can't assume anything other than what the text gives us. That's right. Yeah. Right. So we want that. And then my last my last one, though, is they get to start their final sentence of commentary with either furthermore or therefore, and they have to put due to the fact that in there. So somebody asked here, kids who have teachers that know these specific ideas. Such whatever. Um, Kelly, I would suggest that kids perform better when they know how to articulate their own assumptions that they tie into the text, because that's what commentary is. So teachers that give kids the tools to do that typically have students that perform better. And a lot of times when I work with teachers, it's not teachers not knowing how to teach. It comes down to a lack of preparation in college in particular about how to teach writing well. Because in college, I was told to assign writing. The best way to teach writing is to make sure kids are doing it all the time. Well, that's true. But But. if kids don't know what to do while they're doing it, then that becomes problematic. And yeah. um, when I have some kids that refuse to do the commentary, and Brandon, I'll be done in just a moment. You're fine. I at least tell them, if you don't want to use my templates, you have to make sure that you are articulating what you assume to be true in relation to that evidence that you're making a claim for. So when my kids put the word because at the end of a sentence, if they don't know what to put next because they're struggling too much, I tell them, put the word because and then put the word typically right after because and y'all, there's plenty of research plenty of research that shows that students when students are shown these tools and how these things relate to their thinking their writing gets better not just because they're doing it but because they understand oh these grammatical moves are are not just 
because of rules. It's because of the way it shows thinking. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm happy to share any of that, but if you want to look up the writing revolution on the Atlantic's website, it's a great example of it. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah. So what I do here, okay, is that I tell kids, if you don't want to use a template, then don't, but you got to make sure that you have this type of language showing up in here. I want you talking about connotations because those are assumptions of emotions that we tie to words. I want you saying, since most often this is the case, boom, there's an assumption that you're now tying back to the evidence that you were just talking about. Yep. And these templates um, are pretty simple. And my kids are like, oh, Freda, she's got the easiest class on the planet. And I'm like, well, that's weird because you're all getting fours and fives. <laughs> well, not, not all of them. A lot of them do. And I'm like, and you're following a template, but it's because it's good. It's a good template. Um, and then we work on we work on diversifying like synonyms. So instead of being too repetitive with your language, what are synonyms like? How can we vary the sentence structure? So we do get into that, but I don't get into that until February or March. Yep. Because I want the kids to know these are the parts. Then we can rearrange after. Substance kids, over style. Right. And honestly, I give almost no homework in my AP classes. We do all of our writing in class most of the time, except for my one major paper a year for both of them. Um and they they know how to do it. And so these templates, you know, are where we start and where we go and they know what parts they have to have. And when they really struggle with commentary, they get to know, oh, I just have to fall back on this and I can naturally do that. Oh, yeah. as a reminder, the email of this video will be sent out with all these links and whatnot. Um, yeah. I have kids on a modified block, 84 minutes on Monday, Wednesday, and then 45 minutes on Friday or 84 minutes on Tuesday, Thursday, and 45 minutes on Friday all year. All right, I'm going to stop sharing, um, okay. and I'll let the people do what they have to do, but there are templates here, and if anybody wants a more detailed look into them, please note, just go to the Garden of English on YouTube, and you can search all my videos where it talks about commentary and whatnot, and it gives you examples, and uh, it'll, they'll link you to sheets that you can have and stuff like that. And I have a um, I have a link in the, the deck that I will show everybody here in just a second uh, that um, takes everybody straight to the Garden of English website as well as uh, to the YouTube page. YouTube channel. Uh, so you can access that easily, but I'm going to go ahead and share real quickly just to respect everybody's time as we wrap up. Uh, give me just a moment here. I want to make sure. Yep. All right. Um, so one of the things that, that, that goes along with what Tim did is one of my favorite tools ever. And it's, it's hard to see here um, just because of the, how I had to take a screenshot of it. Um, but it, it's, it, it, I ask students to use this when they start working on the stylistic bits uh, more, uh, but also so it helps them see how to uh, play with their language, uh, combining clauses and things with these different conjunctions. And so uh, you, you might check this out. It's on the deck. Um, but really continue to think about these things, these verbs that make up analyze, what it means to analyze and analysis. And look at those assignments that you're giving kids. Look at those tasks that you're giving kids, because the way the course is laid out, Analysis doesn't come in until the very end when they are given that exam. All right. So when you're giving them some tasks uh, where they're writing a paragraph or, or, or other things, make sure that they understand the parts here. And so uh, I involve breaking, uh, using these words when we break down prompts, like what does it mean to analyze? Okay. I'm going to have to identify these choices. I'm going to have to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then continue to think about inferences. I know you all always are. Um, but how do we think about it? We have to do a meta on us because we are English teachers because we think about these things uh, a certain way. And we got to think about breaking down how the kids can learn that as well. Um, so Tim and I, I'm going to speak for Tim. If I'm wrong, that's fine. We'll stick around uh, for questions uh, after this is over. I always remind teachers we're risk takers and mistake makers uh, with that. Um, shameless self-promotion of the textbooks, but all those things that we're talking about are represented in the books too. Uh, and, and they are, uh, the, the price on these is, is very competitive with the online, um, the online options and things as, as well. Um, another one of our partners is applied practice. We have some new guides for applied practice that have just come out, uh, American speeches for language, but then also flash fiction for literature, the new Frankenstein and new Gatsby that have both language and literature bits in them. We also do mock exams through applied practice. There's a link up here if you're interested. Um, uh, Brandon, I just want to point out one more thing about analysis. Please, quick. Um, sure. I put it. I put it in the chat. But if analysis is identifying, breaking down, and explaining, kids can mm -hmm. write paragraphs that way. In the topic sentence, you identify what the author is doing and why. 
You yep. then break down where it's seen in the text that you put your textual evidence in and your commentary explains how the evidence that you put in achieves the why from the topic sentence. That's, That's right. That's right. Yep. Um, and so I have a, a slide here with all the links that you've seen, as well as Perfection Learning's website uh, for access to uh, these the, the site where this will live on the blogs, as well as uh, textbooks. And then here are my email address and Tim's email address. And we both say thank you. Yeah. Um, again, all of this will be emailed out. Uh, Kristen, I'll hand it over to you. And I will be sticking around to answer a couple of questions, Tim, yeah, uh, I can may too, as yep. well. Great. Thank you all so yeah. much. I'll just do some closing statements and then we'll leave the meeting open so that they can answer some questions. I just, on behalf of everyone, want to thank both of you for your time and your insights this evening. It was great. As a reminder to all the participants, you will get an email tomorrow with a recording of tonight's webinar plus the slide deck. Um, as Brandon mentioned earlier, please take that time to complete the one question survey that will be included in tomorrow's email. It simply asks you what else you'd like to see covered in future webinars. And as Brandon pointed out, we take that very seriously. And the webinar you're seeing right now is a direct result of that survey. And then if you want to hear more from Brandon or Tim, please take the time to subscribe to the Next Step blog from Perfection Learning at nextstep.perfectionlearning.com. Ashley will put that link in the chat. There you will find recordings of their past webinars, blog posts, lesson plans, lots of resources. And then again, as Tim mentioned, please be sure to check out his website, The Garden of English, for even more resources. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening and have a great finish to your week and we'll open it up for questions. All right, so if anybody's got a question, you can just raise your hand. Uh, we'll see, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, we'll be able to see it in the participants and uh, my colleague Ashley will take you off of mute. Annie Rax, Raxco, and Annie, you're going to have to correct me on the pronunciation of your name. I'm sure I ruined it. No, you're very, you're very close. It's Rasco. The C is silent and non-existent. Gotcha. Um, so it's my first year teaching AP Lang, and I'm so excited and loving it. Welcome. Um, thank you. It's it's yeah. a wonderful world to be in. Um, and one of the things, so we're um, in our text. I'm uh, there's another AP Lang teacher at my school, and so I'm just kind of following what he's doing because he's been doing it for the past five years and we're in the argument kind of unit. Um, what would you suggest in terms of like these prompts and if there's anything else that you guys do when you get to the argument essay? Cause we, we took a mock exam for our SGO week and I found that that was the weakest of the three essays just because they ran out of gas and um, the, they pulled evidence from like, like personal anecdotes and stuff and not a lot of um, things. So we did a, an evidence cabinet where I had them look at like current events and history and reading and outside stuff, but push comes to shove. They just went with what they know. So if there, if you could speak to any kind of like activities or things you do for the, the argument essay. Yeah. So there's so much um, that, uh, you know, I'll talk about one or two things real quickly, but there's so much that, you know, if you want to email me, we could, we could have a chat. Oh. Wonderful. Um, thank you. And, and Tim does the same thing. I mean, this is what Tim and I do. We, we meet with people, we coach teachers, you know, we, we do this kind of stuff. So, um, but um, first I'm going to share a link on in the chat to what I call topic cards. Okay. And these are things that pretty much current event kind of stuff that I ask kids to do. And then we can review them because personal anecdotes are fine. You know, to what Tim was saying about their experience. I mean, phenomenologically, if we want to get real fancy about it, all they have is their experience, right? So they've got to draw on that, but we'd like them to write about some other things, some current events, history, stuff like that. So, so don't feel too bad about it if that's what they're doing. Okay, at the year. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I would say that number one piece of advice I give teachers, I know you're working with another teacher and things, but I say, follow the CED. Yeah. Like I, there's no reason to change that up right now. Um, unless you've got a colleague and you guys have to be right together and, and he or she's doing stuff differently, follow the CED. It's designed and scaffolded just for situations like yours. Tim, what are your thoughts? So in relation to argument, um, I, I'm going to share my screen. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> I put a link in the chat. I just put it in there. And the this is my entire playlist, which goes from 
breaking down argument prompts all the way through writing conclusions. But you had talked about evidence in particular. Mm -hmm. um, you can get free access to the document that I mentioned. Sorry, let me mute that here. That I mentioned in this video. It's the second video in the playlist at the link I just sent. Okay. Oh, come on. Like, what is up with that? Um, sorry, I, I need to let it skip. Pim's all like watching the Kardashians on his free time. I know, right? You <laughs> caught me. So I want to just show you what this looks like. Okay. So I actually give this to my kids um, and they do it about eight times throughout the year. Okay. Oh. And what it is, is it's just, it's just summary. Okay. But you're going to notice that the requirement is, is that they have to write a minimum of three sentences, but a maximum of five. And that's because on their essays, they need to be detailed, but they, they can't be too sparse, but they can't, you know, only just tell a story um, and then not provide commentary. So three to five. And my kids don't get any prompts besides the ones that are given here. But you'll notice it's personal experience, acquaintance experience, media knowledge and cultural knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the prompts are give me two of your most give me two impactful moments from your life. Now, the first time that they do this at the beginning of the year. They don't have a clue what's going to help them with their argument prompts. I'm just like, just do this. Just describe the story, right? That's it. And then the next time they're like, well, I already did my two impactful moments. And I'm like, yeah, but you're 17 years old. You should have more than two impactful moments in your life. Um, and then they're like, yeah, but I already talked to my parents about their – the acquaintance experience. Give me their impactful moments. And I'm like, yeah, but you have a brother or a sister or a grandmother or a friend or someone. And then media knowledge is anything they've ever read or seen in a movie that impacted them. And then cultural is typically what they could pull from history class. I tell them to pull it from history all the time. Yep. Or anything they experienced on TV. But I have examples of what these look like. And what happens is the kids don't have any prompts to do this with. I don't start argument until November. And when I bring up my first argument prompt, they've already done this three times. And I say, hey, check out this prompt. How many of you have examples in your in your evidence logs that could actually work to kind of you know convey how you would relate to this argument prompt? And sure enough, there's plenty. If we do this eight times before the exam in May, the night before, they have 64 examples. Wow. Minimum that they can just quickly review. There's no way that two of them will not fit an argument prompt that they see on the next day. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. Um, and so it, it, I don't give them any other prompts besides the directions that are here. So they're like, I'm not, I don't even know what I have to provide commentary for. I'm like, that's just right. You're not. You're just creating a library of knowledge that you have in your own life, your friends' lives, your acquaintances' lives, your media knowledge, and your historical knowledge. And that's what we want to pull from here. I love that. I also um, just found, do you guys ever use the flip side? Oh, I, that, I, I make my, all of my kids subscribe to that. That's the very first thing we do in class every yes. year. Yep. Oh, good. Yeah, because I figured that's a great place to pull from as well and that to add to their arsenal. Thank you so much. You guys are like, AP rock stars. So it's, it's, it's so cool to and be an honor to see you guys in person on a webinar. Thank you. Oh, we love it. You, it's I'm happy to do it. You want to support your class. Honestly, yeah. I'm just, I'm just a dude. Yeah. And, and I'm just, I'm just sharing things that I do and, and people that I talk to, it's all about experience, right? Uh, I won't share my screen, but the topic cards that um, I shared the link to similar to what Tim does. Um, and it, the way I used to do it when I taught language full time was they did a, a one a week. Uh, I had to turn it in at some point. Um, and, uh, then they had all these different examples they could review leading up to the exam. So, yeah. And Kim, I saw your post. I don't know what happened. I will find it. I have saved your email. I'm going to go ahead and put the link to that in the chat right now. Um, because uh, I'm embarrassed. I should have gotten that back to you. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Contact info. Yes. Um, Tim, you want to put your email in the chat and I'll put mine in there. And Kelly had a question about planning and working with a push. I don't know what her specific question is. Yeah. Ashley, can you take her off mute? Hey Kelly, there. what's up? Um, so I am AP Lang first year, but I am paired with AP US history. And for a school year, we have them every other day. And I think it's a perfect, wonderful pairing, but I'm, interested in any guidance anyone has for that yeah um so i think it's i think it's a, a perfect marriage honestly because you can rely on historical texts to teach the things you need to teach but 
you can bring in more contemporary texts to keep them engaged that may thematically link to things that you, your history teacher is covering. The only thing is the history teacher is going to have to know that there have to be thematic connections. That's really important. The history teacher must accept that there will be some thematic connections. It's not necessarily, you know, you're going to read, you're going to read think, a passage. Go ahead. I think you're um, kind of hitting on my concerns is that uh, the history teacher is, amazing, wonderful, been teaching AP forever, but mm -hmm. I'm dealing with kids <laughs> going between factual AP US history stuff. And then yep. what I tell them is AP Lang way more subjective. And like, we're dealing with more of what is the writer saying? So yep. that's a challenge I'm dealing with, but I think it's a blessing that I'm doing them both. Yeah. So the only thing I will say to that is um, it is laying. So it's going to be a little bit more concrete than lit, obviously. And um, you can ground their knowledge of context and their knowledge of audience in the historical bits. And that will be great. Um, so as they learn about the history, as they learn about things going on, and then you're bringing in primary documents, having them do that reading. Um, you, they're still going to have to be able to ground it in the concrete of, how this choice is meant to affect the <sighs> audience in the context historically. Yes. Yeah, uh, so and then they and if they do that on the exam too, if they talk about it historically based upon, oh, they're reading this piece from the 1860s and they're able to connect it to then that's great. That's their broader context. It doesn't have to be a contemporary one. Well, I think I might be in a unique situation where yes, that's my goal, but mm -hmm. translating from AP US history, which is factual to AP language, which is very different, very subjective. So anyway, that's just a yep. unique question. I think oh, it is. I and Tim, Tim shared a good in. link there too, to his DBQ versus synthesis, which is really, really good. I've shared it with people before. Thank you. Uh, you, you can reach out to Tim and I, if you want to talk a little bit about it offline. I think it's a, it's a long discussion. And Kristen, you've got something too? Well, I would say I'd encourage you to check out the blog because just like we have Tim and Brandon do this for the AP English courses, we have lots of consultants for AP social studies as well, who have blog posts and lesson plans and different things on that site. And um, anything they have on AP World would be just as germane as anything for APUSH in terms of making those thematic connections. So check out some of the posts we have there and see if there's anything that might help with some of this. Yeah. Um, I want to just point out one more thing that you can do with APUSH and AP Lang. Um, the APUSH units, right? In AP Lang, you're teaching kids rhetorical analysis, argument, and synthesis. And with APUSH, if you know the kids are in a certain time frame in AP US history at this moment, when you're teaching rhetorical analysis, just grab a speech from that time period and teach the rhetorical analysis with that speech. But then another thing that you can do is you can actually ask your APUSH teacher, hey, what's something that's controversial that happened during this time period? Yep. And then create an argument prompt. So when you're in argument, right? And let's say that you're in, um, you know, let, let's say you're in civil war time. Maybe you want to generate an argument prompt that actually relates to, fed, I, you know what, actually, let's go back. Let's go back a little bit. Let's go to Hamilton time. Um, you know, let's say they're studying like, you know, the um, Hamilton and right after the revolution. Um, and even when Hamilton was the treasurer and, and whatnot, um, there was a real argument about, the federal government as opposed to the you know micro government and that's one of the debates that happens today so you could very easily take what they're doing there yep. and say argue your position on to what extent the federal government should be expanded that fits right in with what they're studying if they're dealing with the federalists uh, and they're studying either studying Hamilton and whatnot. So you can really find those controversial moments. And of course, they're not creating a historical argument like the cause and effect reasoning that the history kids have to do, but they can rely on their historical knowledge and what they're actually looking at in their classes. And you can really rely on your AP US history teacher to do that, to help you create that prompt by just saying, can you just tell me something that was controversial going on at that time that you're mentioning? And every yep. historical time period has it, right? To what extent was the United States um, correct in engaging in the Vietnam War. Like, boom, th th there's your argument prompt. Mm -hmm. The kids don't have to do the history, like, 
the historical reasoning, they have to actually justify their argument. So that's the easiest way that I've seen to integrate the two. And it puts a little bit extra on the a push teacher to kind of say, I can give you the controversial moment and you can then take that controversial moment and let them use historical examples, but relate it to the present day. Yeah, thank you, Tim, for that. Yeah, and, and Kelly, what Tim was just talking about is what I was saying about um, you know, talking to the teacher about thematic connections and things like that that you can bring in text. So I'm glad we got that. But, well, everybody, it is 20 past. We're going to have to bounce. You've got our email addresses. Reach out to us. Again, this is what we do. We love doing it. Um, I hope to hear from you, and you will receive emails from Perfection in the next day or two with all these materials and the links. I've embedded them in there. But Tim, thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll be in touch and yep. uh, everybody else, please be in touch and look for our next webinar in October. See you soon.